It is Friday, March 19th. Let's talk PlayStation. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Let's start off, as always, with our PS Plus reminder. The March games that are currently available right now is Final Fantasy VII Remake, Remnant from the Ashes, Farpoint, Maquette for PS5, Destruction All-Stars for PS5, and our first news story is another reminder. Make sure you also grab the 2016 Ratchet & Clank Remake as part of the Play at Home initiative, so still on PSN, totally free, even outside of a Plus membership. That's the huge bonus here. And also, what's really noteworthy is that Sony announced the next round of Play at Home titles that will be available. And it's not just one or two games, it's 10 games total, and they're all really good titles. So starting March 25th, you'll be able to download Abzu, Enter the Gungeon, Res Infinite, Subnautica, The Witness, also PSVR games like Astrobot Rescue Mission, Moss, Thumper, Paper Beast. These will all be available until April 22nd. Starting April 19th until May 14th, you'll also be able to grab Horizon Zero Dawn, the complete edition, which is really fantastic news because not only is Horizon a really great game, but it is the complete edition. So I know for myself and many others included, sometimes you'll buy and play games when they come out or around when they come out. But for whatever reason, time, money, you know, whatever the case may be, you might not go back for that DLC. But this might apply to you even if you've already played Horizon because you will have access to the Frozen Wilds expansion. And like we've been saying previously, some of these games are available or they were available through PS Plus. So you might already have them that way, but still claim these titles because they can overwrite your PS Plus license that way, if your Plus membership runs out or you let it lapse, uh, you'll still have access to all these games. They're tied to your PSN ID forever, essentially. This is why this is such a fantastic benefit. So it's good to see this, especially, you know, considering this past week was largely a Game Pass week for in terms of news and announcements. So good to see something here in the PlayStation ecosystem that is fairly aggressive. And, you know, granted, it's part of a goodwill program relating to, to COVID. That's initially what the Play at Home initiative was all about. But still behind the scenes, you know, Sony's running some numbers and evaluating what it's like to give away, you know, 10 qual you know, very quality pieces of software for, for free. That's the same thing with the PlayStation Plus collection. You know, what are the implications there if you give away 20 really good games with the service? You know, Plus has been doing much better, but you know, we've complained before about the state of plus uh, the plus collection sitting there doing nothing and ps now of course so hopefully this will instill more confidence in sony to eventually get more aggressive with their services and imp improve the value proposition overall moving on to our next news story this is one that we unfortunately couldn't catch on last week's episode because it came out right after the upload but the february mpd recently came out and we learned that up to this point so four months in the market ps5 is now the fastest selling console in the US in terms of dollar sales. So that's the one caveat here in terms of overall revenue being generated because PS5 is inherently a pretty pricey console at $499 versus PS4, which the retail price back then, 2013 and 14, was $399. But in terms of units, it's not that far behind. In fact, less than 1% of a difference between PS4 and 5 in terms of actual units. So they're pretty much neck and neck, but PS5 will inherently generate more money because the vast majority of PS5 is being sold are disc-based consoles and that will retail for $499. But essentially PS5 is doing very well considering you can't even buy one and there's a global semiconductor shortage. So it stands to reason that if Sony didn't have an issue with manufacturing this thing, um, there would be a lot more versus PlayStation 4. And that's what they've been preaching even prior to the console coming out is that we're making more of these things versus PS4. Um, and that may have been true to an extent, but it was very close in relation to PS4. The demand is just much higher this time around. Uh, and, you know, back then PS4 was breaking records left and right, and now Sony's doing the same thing again, or at least they're trying to, but this really is the only situation that's holding them back is how many units that they can reasonably manufacture. There were, uh, I think, a few other stock drops this past week, and they just still go out in less than less than a second. You refresh the page, they're, <laughs> they're automatically gone, basically. It's still an issue. Um, I would really like to know, and same for Series S and X, if there were enough of these things, like if they just, they reasonably made as many as they possibly could up to the point where the demand finally cools down, you can walk into a store, no problem, you can order online whenever you want, how many would that really take until, you know, it, it just wasn't an issue? That's what I want to know because there were plenty of PS4s back then. I don't remember it being this difficult in the first quarter of 2014. You know, PS4 was in hot demand, but it was not a problem back then. You could still, you know, comfortably, somewhat comfortably buy a PS4 back then as far as I remember. But yeah, Sony's still doing incredibly well with this console. And Microsoft and Nintendo as well. All these machines are doing very well. 
Next up, in unsurprising news, Sony did confirm that come April 1st, they will be shutting down the community's feature on PlayStation 4, which we all saw coming based off of the mobile app shutting down months ago, or very recently, PS4 Beta Firmware 8.50, putting it in its release notes that they're removing the feature. So I know a lot of people are initially disappointed, but even if you actively used communities, then you have to know that this was a half-baked feature to begin with, so it wasn't very intuitive or usable. There were never any good additional features added to it, so I liked it in practice when it was introduced, but they just didn't do anything with it, and that's really my problem. And so if they ever do something in terms of a social feature aspect on PS5, which in my opinion the console definitely needs because it feels a bit lonely on PS5 in terms of the overall user experience, if they do that, then I would hope that they really go all in or at least set a foundation in place that they'll build upon instead of just putting something in there and then never altering it or changing it or improving it. So that's just uh, kind of how I feel on the whole thing. Moving on to our next news story, Square Enix and more specifically Tetsuya Nomura did confirm that the Yuffie DLC for Final Fantasy VII Remake Integrate is going to be the only DLC for the game and essentially once they're done with that, the, well, the sequel, the remake part two is what they're going to be completely focusing on. That'll be the priority, which is good. I think a lot of people were a bit concerned here that Final Fantasy 15 saw a ridiculous amount of additional content. And for the context of this game, where we got a small part of what is the entire Final Fantasy 7 story, and we're all kind of wondering how, how many parts and how reasonably long is it going to take to have the full thing shipped and completed, which you know at that point, once they do it, then they're going to do a you know big bundle towards the end where it's all the games and all the additional content packs. You know, what does that really look like and how long would some how long would somebody have to wait until we get there? Uh, well, at least right now we have the knowledge that Yuffie, the Yuffie DLC is just that. It's one little thing for um, the current Part 1 remake and they're working directly on Part 2. Now, while we're talking about Square Enix, we can also mention Project Athia, the PS5 timed console exclusive that we're expecting in 2022. Well, we recently got some more information about this game, namely what it's called, and also the protagonist, some small details and a new gameplay trailer. So this game is called Forspoken. The protagonist, her name is Frey, and she's played by Ella Belinska. And the quick synopsis that we got for this title is that it's about a young woman who must harness her magical abilities to survive in this fantastical yet dangerous land of Athia. And in this short clip of footage that we got, we can see that Freya is wearing what looks like regular clothes and she's kind of shocked about the environment that she's in. So it's like this grounded reality, but also fantasy style game. Uh, looks gorgeous. And the short clips we got towards the end of it where there's a lot of uh, very fast traversal throughout the environment. Um, this game looks impressive. It really does look uh, gorgeous. Uh, still coming 2022. That's all we know right now. So it'll still be quite a while before we see uh, more about the game and obviously play it. I mean, the thing is, 2022 is not that far away. I mean, time seems to be going very quick because uh, it's already been a year since, like, the virus really happened, right? And that's kind of the epiphany a lot of us are having right now is that, oh my gosh, it's it's March again, right? So, actually, 2022 is... Uh, maybe it's going to feel like it's right around the corner. So, um, hopefully we do see the game sooner and it looks in the same shape or better, right? And speaking of which, one game that we should be getting very soon is Returnal. This past week we got a new story trailer for the game and honestly the more I see about this game and learn about it I just I'm getting more and more excited genuinely. I It's very rare that I get this hyped but I just love Housemark's gameplay and more so I'm excited to see their first real crack at telling a story because this is the first time where they're really going all in on having this narrative that's tied directly to their gameplay which that's something they've really been preaching but watching this trailer um, it's just so ominous and eerie and a little bit spooky it's just it's really starting to pull me in so I can't wait to try it uh, over on the PlayStation blog they did give us some light details about that story which we kind of already picked up on what was happening here so Celine is a deep space scout she goes against her orders to check out this planet that's got this weird white shadow signal coming from it and of course every single time you die the biome around you changes and whatnot but one aspect of the gameplay that we learned is that it's got that asynchronous uh, multiplayer kind of like souls where you can see uh, somebody's death animation or how they died more or less and one cool angle is that apparently you can either loot the body that you find for you know a quick cheap reward I'm guessing or you could go a little bit further and they didn't say this specifically but it kind of it's written there in plain writing on the PS blog it makes it sound as though you can replay the the situation that they were in right so you can jump into their loop 
uh, or their, their weird gameplay biome that they found, found themselves in and you can try to revenge their death and if you do possibly the reward is much greater there which sounds really cool. I actually really love in Souls games where you can see the the death animation. I don't like multiplayer but I like a, I almost like having social interaction but not actually having it. Do you know what I mean? Maybe that sounds a little strange but I am really excited and we're only a little over a month away which when the game comes out even if it's good I just know it's going to get, the conversation around it is going to get dominated by the, yeah, it's good, but it's not $70 good. And that's kind of, that's like already initially upsetting, but that's assuming that the game even is well received to begin with. But I feel like that's probably what's going to happen. Now for our next news story, I think this caught a lot of us by surprise because we weren't really expecting to get this information so soon, but just yesterday, Sony revealed the brand new next generation PSVR controllers for PS5, which it was only a few weeks ago that we learned about the headset being confirmed, right? But it was in the same way that we were expecting a PS blog post saying, yes, it's coming, no pictures, no crazy details, just we'll talk about it later. And to their credit, they did say they'll talk about it this year, but I think a lot of us were like, oh, a few months from now, maybe late 2021. But no, we got the controllers, we know what they look like, I'm showing them to you now, and we do have some additional details. So, well, one, that orb-shaped design, so they did that purposely to make sure the controllers are comfortable and they're natural. They apparently tested this with multiple hand sizes and they went over many iterations, which is expected. Uh, adaptive triggers, they are there. They function just like the DualSense, same with haptic feedback. So again, the same functionality that you feel when playing with a DualSense, that's going to be in these controllers. Also, finger touch detection. So this is what we really want to hear about. The controller can detect your fingers without any pressing in the areas where you would place your thumb, index, or middle fingers. Uh, the new controllers are tracked by the headset through the tracking ring across the bottom of the controller. There's also a split button design. So the left controller has one analog stick, triangle, square, a grip button, that would be L1, a trigger button, that'd be L2, and then the create button. The right controller would contain basically the same, but the opposite. So X and circle, R1, R2, and options. And prototypes are going to developers very soon. So I think that's probably why we're seeing this right now. Sony wants to reveal the controllers on their terms, and that's totally understandable given the context of a prototype going out to a large community of VR developers that are usually smaller in nature. Uh, normally when you work with big AAA developers and publishers, ironically that can be a little bit more controlled through you know, lawyers and things like that, and a few people at the studio having access to that new hardware or the peripherals, but either way, uh, we know what it looks like and it looks good. I mean, the thing is we have the important stuff there, so the finger tracking is really cool. Um, the split design might be a little bit polarizing or jarring for some, but once you get the hang of it, you'll realize how intuitive it can be for the software that does end up getting uh, getting made. And more importantly, the headset is tracking, so not any sort of uh, camera that needs to be set up on the TV. And uh, well, that's really important for the overall price proposition of this headset in the end. So the one thing that people are still you know, a little bit upset about is the, the headset's not truly wireless. It's one cord, so still a huge quality of life jump. We have to remember that this is a headset that needs to strike a very good balance between performance but also price. So it's not astronomically expensive on top of already owning a PS5. So it's not going to be cheap to get to get into one of these things if you don't have a PS5 at all to begin with. But um, we've got probably a much better reliable tracking system versus you know the Move controllers and the camera and PSVR right now. So we know how that's a huge pain. Um, I'm, I'm just hoping that this thing works flawlessly or as seamless as what we see with oculus and i mean the the good thing is that these are probably in all likelihood bundled with every single headset that is sold so i'm imagining with developers there's the option of developing a game with only using the dual sense but also you could take advantage of the motion controllers and if you ship these controllers in every single box whereas that wasn't the case with psvr you can make software and know that every single psvr owner on ps5 has these controllers and that's really important for the overall attach rate of these games. Next up, this is also surprising news, but Sony's funding a brand new independent studio founded by Jade Raymond called Haven Entertainment Studios, working on a new unannounced IP for PlayStation. So Jade Raymond, if you don't know, she just recently left Google Stadia. She was leading their first party development. And if you've been following the news, you know that Google closed down their first party operations. So everybody was laid off, including her, she left. and. You know, back in 2019, she was a very prolific hire. So back then, this is when Google was courting a lot of major talent to oversee the Google Stadia program. But 
Um, Jade Raymond has a very impressive CV, so throughout her career she's uh, formed brand new teams, oversaw major projects, created major franchises like Assassin's Creed, Watch Dogs, uh, also working on Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of the Patriots, The Sims Online is where she started, um, most recently, or before Google rather, was Star Wars Battlefront 2, so... You know, she's done a lot of impressive things. And this announcement is very much like what we saw with Kojima when he left Konami. So she just left Google Stadia, formed her own team, and this is Sony really funding them and helping them get off the ground more or less. And in a situation like this, we're pretty much assuming, but this is probably a second party game. Sony will have IP ownership or at minimum console exclusivity, and then it can go to PC or something like that, right? But um, it'll be a long time before we see what this project is, two, three, four years down the line, however long it takes. Um, you know, depending on the size of the game, we could see it sooner, but very much like a Kojima situation, Sony just stepped in, offered the funding, and uh, they'll give Jade her creative freedom and her team creative freedom, which is really important. So Jade was quoted on the PS blog saying, we want to create worlds where players can escape, have fun, express themselves, and find community. We want to pour our passion into a project. We want to make something wondrous for people to experience because we believe in the power of games to bring joy to people's lives, and Sony does too. Their commitment to excellence is unmatched. It's why I couldn't be happier for their backing and support. So for right now, that's really all we can say, but we will obviously be watching this project closely and any sort of updates that we eventually end up seeing, and I can't wait to see what they're working on. Now finally, our last major surprising news story here that nobody really saw coming was Sony announced a joint acquisition effort with the esports business RTS to acquire EVO, Evolution Championship Series. Uh, the largest fighting game tournament ever, basically. It happens every single year, or it normally does. It didn't happen last year because of not only the virus, but also some uh, sexual misconduct allegations against the CEO, and I think there was one other person involved, something like that. I didn't follow it too closely, not too into the fighting game scene, but I think with this announcement, initially a lot of people, you know, saw this yesterday and were like, what? But if you do look at this somewhat holistically, it makes a... Uh, it makes more sense considering that, well, the fighting game scene, uh, in terms of tournaments and esports, it's largely dominated by console play, which is one of the few genres that really, it's the only genre where it's, it favors console play. Uh, pretty much everything else is PC or mobile, um, and Sony's actually been heavily involved in EVO, EVO over the years, so not only do they do live streams on their channel, but they've promoted and supported the, the tournament every single year. They've always been a, um, a sponsor. And obviously, fighting games have a huge... They're largely synonymous with PlayStation consoles, so not only are they largely played on PlayStation, but um, things like Street Fighter, for example, where it had exclusivity with Five. Um, it's just... It's one of those things where esports grows every single year under Sony's ownership. They can sort of clean up the organization and obviously bring it, do uh, bring it down a path of uh, organic growth. And obviously, it's, you know, a moneymaker. The, I guess the one thing is Nintendo's involvement, because... Smash is a huge thing, and <clears throat> Nintendo responded recently saying that they're just watching how it'll play out and always evaluating uh, tournaments and things like that. Pretty much a standard PR answer, nothing direct about how they'll you know, approach Evo moving forward or if they'll even be involved. And the one thing to also consider here is that Sony's not administering, or they're not forcing console play or all their all hardware moving forward to be strictly PlayStation. They're pretty much still allowing it to function largely how it was before. So, and that's really the best way to approach it. You don't want Sony to step in and do something that, um, you know, puts off the community and the people involved and participating and actually uh, keeping the organization alive. So um, I think this is going to be kind of a largely a hands, well, not a hands-off thing, but something that won't see dramatic change or at least not in the short term for the fighting game scene. Hopefully Sony will just take care of what it is and again grow it organically to something to to where it's even bigger and better over time. And uh, for whatever reason, I'm seeing a lot of people bring up PS All Stars 2. That that has nothing to do with this. I don't know why that's a thing. I mean, look, if you want a sequel, that's fine. But like, one, that's not the way to do it, and two, this would be the worst way to do it if they did to somehow shoehorn in PS All Stars in the Evo. That's no, that that doesn't make any sense, but um, hey, I appreciate your enthusiasm. I would like to see them take a genuine crack at a sequel, but probably not going to happen. Moving on to our next news story, this is also something that I did not think we would be discussing, so technically another surprising news story. 
but Little Big Planet 1, 2, and 3's online servers have been down for about a week, so close to when I uploaded last week's episode, but I guess this happened from a disgruntled fan who sent out DDoS attacks on the servers, and that brought them down, and they've been down for close to a week now, and Sony's responded at this point, uh, stating that they're working on a fix, and you know if you're trying to get in, you know be patient. But right now, at least for LBP 1, 2, and 3, you can't you know play levels online or publish levels, anything like that. Um, LBP Vita is apparently unaffected, but that's the situation so far. Pretty interesting. Don't know why somebody would go out of their way to bring the servers down, especially if you're a fan of the franchise. But I mean, not many people are obviously playing it. We do the video series every single year where we check in on old PS3 games, and I don't think it made the final cut in the 2021 video, but I did boot up Little Big Planet 1. Still people on there, not a lot of course, but there are still people actively creating levels and playing every so often. It's still a franchise that's a lot of fun to, to go back to, and I would, I would guess this is not a high priority for Sony, so <laughs> I'm surprised that it's been a week and it's still not back up, but... Um, let's hope it recovers soon. Now, you know we had to talk about this, but Game Informer recently published a story on Mark Cerny and his fascination with trophies, which is incredible. So the PS4, Vita, and PS5 architect was asked directly about his Platinums and how he goes about earning them. Shout out to Andrew Reiner for actually following through with a story like this and asking Mark these questions. Sounds like this is something I would have done, basically. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to link it down below so you can go check it out, and you definitely should. But a few quick facts that we did learn. Mark has about 33 Platinum Trophies, which he should have more at this point because the interview was probably conducted a few months ago. They're talking about him earning the Platinum and Cuphead, which was back in October. But there's that. Also, Mark apparently tends to avoid uh, games that require online trophies. I'm right there with you, Mark. Most people that like to trophy hunt really hate that. Really fascinating stuff. It's interesting that Mark, uh, who is a very busy individual, actually does have some time to go out of his way to fully complete and platinum games, which can be a huge time sink nowadays. But uh, yeah, that was a really cool story. So thanks to Andrew for asking those questions. Now with all that out of the way, it is time to get to Let's Talk Plus. The weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. If you would like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. Follow the link down below. Supporting this channel a number of ways can gain you an entry. And I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to pay for your games. Those are all the news stories that I want to talk about with you all. Our Tuesday video was about PS5 accessories from eBay. So back in December, we checked out some of the early ones on Amazon, but eBay's flooded with a lot of different accessories now, including some additional faceplates, which are very cheap depending on what auction you buy from, but they're all pretty much the same. So just as an FYI, always be mindful of that. But go check out that overview of all the accessories that you could buy. A lot of them aren't that great, <laughs> but this coming Tuesday, we've got uh, another video coming. I don't know what it is just yet, but you know, there's probably going to be something there on Tuesday as always. And that's about it. That concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Panecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you all next Friday.